Bonjour and welcome back to the history of the United States since 1877. In the past couple of videos, we studied the politics of race in the 1950s and 60s in the US. And we studied it mostly from the perspective of uh, black activists who wanted to obtain equality with whites, so people that are in favor of the civil rights movement. Today we'll look at the other side of the equation and we'll talk about white segregationists who opposed uh, that movement for desegregation. We will focus on George Corley Wallace, in part because he was governor of Alabama, so that kind of a ground zero of many of his struggles, and also became, he became the poster child for the anti-desegregation camp, and also because he had a long, important political career with important consequences uh, for the conservative movement all the way to today. Actually, if you want to learn more about his life, The Politics of Rage uh, by Mr. Carter, and there's a great PBS documentary that was made based on that book as well. So what about George Corley Wallace? Well, he came from Alabama, obviously, and he's a bit like Huey Long in the sense that he's a young man who comes from a poor background and has no intention to spend his life on the farm. And early in his life, he went to the Capitol as a young aide and then stood on the star where apparently President Jefferson Davis took the oath of office back in the days of the Civil War and made a pledge to everybody that he would one day be governor of Alabama. And by everybody, I mean probably passers-by who were wondering why that 18-year-old was doing crazy talk in front of the, the Capitol. Like many men of his generation, he served in World War II and apparently did so with great courage. One thing about his record that is worth noting is that he could have been promoted pretty high as officer but refused to do so because he figured after World War II there would be a lot more privates who would be voting in Alabama than there would be officers, so he would look more like one of the guys. So even when he's uh, an engineer on a B-29 bomber over Japan, he's already thinking about his political career back home if he survives that thing. When he ran for governor for the first time, and that's really his lifelong dream, in the late 50s, he did so as a progressive. He was a Democrat, but that's not a big surprise. Every person that gets elected in the South back then is a Democrat. But you had some Democrats that were more conservative and others that were more progressive, and he was definitely in the progressive branch. So he wanted roads and schools and that kind of stuff, and that's what he ran on. When he ran in the primary, and remember that the Democratic primary is the only thing that matters because in the general election, only white Democrats get elected uh, back then in the South. Well, the opponent he had against him had no program whatsoever except race, that he was going to keep the segregation of the races. And Wallace, who was a far more open-minded person, who had served on the board of trustees at Stuckey University, who had black acquaintances, well, he went down in defeat. And the lesson he drew from that defeat, which really crushed his dream of being governor of Alabama, uh, was, I guess, the right one politically, but the wrong one morally. That to be elected in the late 50s, early 60s in Alabama, the one thing that matters is to hate black people. And he used the N-word a lot, I'm afraid, so I'll just use a quote, uh, pardon the tense. Uh, he said, well, boys, no son of a bitch will ever out me again. I guess two insults in one single sentence, end quote. So basically in the next election in 62, he ran purely on race. And this time he was elected. And famously in January of 63, when he took office as governor of Alabama, he made a speech uh, where, where he pledged that it would be segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And that's a French man trying to do his best impersonation of an accent from Alabama. The big issue at the time was the desegregation of school, which had been mandated by the Supreme Court decision, uh, Brown v. Board of Education back in 54, but was far from being the norm everywhere in the South yet. And you have a lot of rear gone actions in Mississippi or in Little Rock, Arkansas against that. And Wallace had pledged during the election that he would prevent uh, that kind of opening of the schools. And he would stand at the schoolhouse door if necessary. And what you see on the picture is him doing just that standing at the school door, just like he promised during the campaign. Though all of that was just for show, because at the very same time that he was making his stand at another building, which was the actual registration building, some black students were registering. And that's the problem with George Corley Wallace. When he talks about race, you never know whether he means it for real, because initially he was quite progressive and then switched to a racist person, or whether he wants to just be elected and that is just for show, is playing uh, the white folks in Alabama just to get their votes. 
And if you notice Tom Hanks standing somewhere around the picture, well, that's because it's from the movie uh, Forrest Gump, a delightful movie if you like U.S. history. And the joke is that Tom Hanks shows up at every single historic moment in recent U.S. history, including George Wallace, University of Alabama, 63. So in the 60s, as the civil rights movement was in full uh, swing, uh, Wallace really became the symbol of the people that opposed Martin Luther King and such. A famous case took place in 1965 when you have that march in Selma, Alabama, where a number of activists tried to go across Peters Bridge simply to demand the right to vote. And Wallace famously unleashed the state police and National Guard to go against the demonstrators in a way that was quite violent with the dogs and water hoses and such. And as it happened, this was broadcast that night on the nightly news. On one particular channel, what was showing up that night was a documentary on the Holocaust, and so the uh, channel had to interrupt that broadcast for important news from Alabama, and you switch to white police beating up black demonstrators in Selma, and then you switch back to Nazi police beating up Jewish people in uh, Nazi Germany. And you could see how a lot of viewers could make a parallel that it's just a different kind of racism. So that made him quite popular with the white segregation is both in Alabama and a few thousand states, uh, but almost radioactive on a national level because of his extreme views. And the national level is where he wanted to be next because he dreamed of being not just governor, but president of the United States. And so he ran in 1964 and again in 68 and 72 and 76. When he started to run for presidential campaign, he had to kind of change his arguments because of kind of knee-jerk racism that might play well in a primary in Alabama in the early 60s and might not play quite as well with a more moderate audience on a national level. So he stopped using the N-word at that point, at least not in public, and then instead used, uh, started talking about uh, other issues that were more conservative in a broader sense. That uh, in the 1960s, as part of all the changes in society that are taking place at the time, the divorce rate starts going up. And you should know he got divorced a couple of times himself. And so he had a lot of broken families, and he presents himself as a defender of family value. And eventually, by the early 70s, abortion becomes legal. By the early 60s, appeal is legal. So there's a sexual revolution ongoing, and even though he had quite a few affairs of his own, in public he would rail against that. There's also a lot more violence going on in the 60s, uh, riots and so forth, and some of the Democratic voters are supporting the rioters and the demonstrators because they think the police are pigs. In his case, he's definitely on the side of law and order, and the army, and the police. In the 60s, you have the war on poverty, where many programs are created to help the poor. Well, I would be definitely against it, thinking that all that is financed by taxes uh, derived from people that actually work, and are given that to people that don't do much. Uh, a lot of these things would have a racial undertone. Uh, that when you talk about welfare, you hint that you're uh, talking about the, a black mother in Harlem. And when you talk about law and order, you're already talking about the riot in an inner city ghetto in Newark, New Jersey. So that way is that you can still recycle the same racial agendas, but you use code word for that. And this is still used today in presidential politics. It would be called dog whistles. Uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, in the 1980s, uh, railed a lot against welfare queens. Uh, wink, wink black welfare queens. And you have a case too in the 88 election where George Bush uh, Sr. used a case of a black rapist who had been released from prison and then had attacked a white woman time and time again to attack his opponent Michael Dukakis as being soft on crime. But again, you use a black convict uh, for your example. So uh, a lot of the methods that he used in the 60s would then be recycled later on uh, by the Republican Party, specifically starting in the 70s with Richard Nixon in what he called the Southern Strategy to the point where many of these values eventually migrated from the conservative Democratic Party to more the Republican Party nowadays. And if you look at all the programs that I outlined, reducing welfare benefits, protecting family values, God, guns, anti-abortion, law and order, that would be pretty much the standard platform of the Republican Party today. So he failed to get the nomination in 64 because that's when Johnson was re-elected president. He ran again in 68, this time as a third party candidate. And we encounter a number of third-party candidates in the U.S. Uh, we talk, for example, of uh, Eugene Fidesz, who was a socialist candidate many times around 1900. We also talked about Teddy Roosevelt trying to be elected president as a member of the Bull Moose Party in 1912. Also of Robert LaFollette Sr. running as a progressive in 1924. 
And every time that happened, we said, well, and by the way, they lost. It's difficult in a two-party system like the U.S. to win as a third-party candidate. The 68 election, however, was a bit of an unusual election. Uh, it started that year in January of 68 when the president, Johnson, who should have run for re-election again, uh, faced a major uprising in Vietnam. It's called the Tet Offensive, and it was so unpopular due to that that he announced that he would not seek re-election. So it's wide open on the Democratic side. And the person that seemed to be the leading candidate for a while was Robert Kennedy, the brother of the slain president, until he won the primary in California. And the night of that, he got shot himself. And that's the same year, by the way, that Martin Luther King got shot. So it's just one event after another. Eventually, Hubert Humphrey became the presidential candidate on the Democratic side. Uh, but clearly, he had some opposition within other Democrats. And when he had the Democratic National Convention in Chicago that year, he had plenty of fighting that broke out outside between liberal Democratic demonstrators and the far more conservative uh, Chicago police. Uh, so it's very wide open. On the Republican side, the candidate would be Richard Nixon, who himself had a lot of baggage. He had been defeated back in 1960, and people either loved him or hated him. Uh, so it seemed like a one time, that one year, maybe, where maybe a third party candidate could do well. And initially, he did well on the poll. Uh, George Kelly Wallace seemed like he might throw the election into the House of Representatives or maybe win outright. So everything was wide open. He had to pick a vice presidential running mate and decided, because he wanted to be uh, appearing as a kind of a law and order guy, to pick Curtis LeMay, an Air Force general, as his vice presidential running mate. Uh, we talked about Curtis LeMay already. He had been in charge of a bombing campaign against Japan during World War II, which was controversial enough because that resulted in the deaths of many Japanese civilians. And then when the Cold War began, he was in charge of the Strategic Air Command, which is a branch of the Air Force in charge of delivering nuclear weapons on Russia, if necessary, all these B-52 bombers. And most people in the Cold War were deathly afraid of nuclear bombs for a good reason, but Curtis LeMay was pretty enthusiastic about them because he was in charge of delivering them, and he thought, well, if I have to drop bombs on the Soviet Union and start a war and kill 50 million people, so be it. So he would be one of these people known as nuclear use seers, people that were in favor of using nuclear bombs if necessary, or the nuts for short. And so many Americans were quite concerned that if, uh, say, George Kelly Wallace was elected president and then got shot, because that seems to happen all the time in the 60s, well, LeMay would be the president next, and he might be uh, starting a nuclear war for some reason. So when LeMay was first introduced at a press conference by the Wallace campaign, he was told, OK, answer every question that you can, but do not mention nuclear bombs. And sure enough, after he made his speech, it's a Q&A session, and the first question from a reporter is, by the way, Mr. LeMay, if you ever become president, what will be your view on using nuclear weapons in combat? And LeMay's face just lit up. That was his favorite topic, and he explained that he would be very happy to use nuclear bombs. People were too afraid of them. So that kind of sank the campaign of George Conley Wallace right there. It was already an uphill battle as a third-party candidate. If you have an unpopular vice presidential running mate, that doesn't help. So eventually it was Richard Nixon that was elected in 68. In 72, uh, Wallace came back to run again in the campaign. In that case, he's back in the Democratic fold. And there's a big battle going on in the Democratic Party in the 70s to know where does it stand on racial issues. Traditionally, the South had been solely Democratic since the Civil War, since Lincoln had been a Republican. But because Johnson, another Democrat, had decided to embrace civil rights in the 1960s, a lot of white segregationists uh, were fleeing the party in droves and Richard Nixon, a Republican, was welcoming them by taking a stance on racial issues that would be more conservative. It was called the Southern Strategy. So you have a big fight in that 72 primary between the liberal branch of the party, that would be George McGovern, that is very much pro-civil rights and anti-war in Vietnam, and the more traditional conservative side of the Democratic Party, and that would be George Corley Wallace, uh, pro-law and order, pro-Vietnam War, and anti-racial integration. As it happened, uh, the campaign of Wallace didn't go too far because he also encountered an assassin. Uh, his name was Arthur Bremer, one of these people in U.S. history, like Carl Weiss or the Harvey Oswald, uh, well known only for one thing, they shot somebody famous. In that case, he was not killed by Arthur Bremer, but he was left incapacitated and had to drop out of the 72 campaign and, in fact, spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair in terrible pain. He ran again in the 76 Democratic primary, but Jimmy Carter was the one that won that time. So in a way, there's something bitter about him that his big dream of becoming a U.S. president never quite happened, in part because he had so much baggage from his years as governor of Alabama. Uh, 
and in part because of some happenstance in the 68, 72 election. But there's some bitterness too because many of the ideas that he put forward, uh, the whole agenda would then be kind of stolen by the Republican Party of the 80s and turn into a winning combination that would allow people like uh, Reagan or Newt Gingrich or Bush Sr. or Bush Jr. or Donald Trump more recently uh, to be elected. So a very important figure in the long-term history of the conservative movement, even though in his career he did not succeed as well as he should have. This is a man who had changed a lot also from a progressive early in his career to an arch-segregationist in the early 60s to a more mainstream uh, conservative from the late 60s to the 70s. Well, he changed once again in the 1980s when he went back to being governor of Alabama and all of a sudden announced that he had been misunderstood and he had always been in favor of desegregation. That the whole point about him standing at the schoolhouse door was just about defending states' rights, that he had nothing against black people. And he made a point of inviting different civil rights activists that he had wronged in the past and inviting them into the governor's mansion so that he could sit with them and talk with them and maybe have a photo op as well. How do you make sense of that? Either it is because he's an old man who reflects on his past and realizes that he has done things that are wrong and he wants to kind of make peace with his enemies before he meets his maker, or is it just the same old politician who changes ideas right and left just to get votes? Uh, I think it's more the latter because by the 1980s, since a lot of white people in the South have moved uh, to the, the Republican Party, at the same time, black voters, who used to be more pro-Republican since the days of Lincoln, are now moving into the Democratic Party. There's kind of a switch going on, and so his electorate now would be mostly black people in Alabama. So maybe he's changing his ideas one last time for the same reason, to get some votes. I'll let you decide on the matter yourself. Well, that's it for today. Next time we'll talk about the last big reform movement in the 1960s, and that will be the fight for gender equality, the feminist movement. Au revoir, see you next time.